third and 10, 17 yard line, seven seconds to go, takes the snap, back to throw, steps up, fires it to the end zone, it's caught at the one yard line, Giants stand him up, he's not in, Game and over. the Giants get him run out, the Giants stop him at the one yard line, holy cow! <laughs> Kristen Kirk made the catch at the one, and then the Giants rallied to the ball, and the ball game is over. Boy, oh boy. We made that too much of a close game, but hey, back to the lab we go. More work to be done. Let's rock, though. Hey, back to work, boys. All right, starts now. Here we go. Giants on three. One, two, three. Oh. Welcome to the Coach Dable Show, presented by Stop and Shop, the official supermarket of the New York Giants. We've got an action-packed show ahead of us, including strategy with Carl Banks. And with that, I'd like to welcome in our two-time Super Bowl champion, Carl Banks, alongside head coach of the New York Giants, the 6-1 and one New York Giants. Coach, good to see you. How you feeling? Good. Yeah, we just, uh, you know, had a hard-fought game. Um, you no know, credit to the players. They played well for 60 minutes. It took all 60 minutes, but good to get a win. Yeah, no doubt. Another thrilling ending uh, to, to another game. I'm curious, is it too early for the Victory Monday? Like, when, when does that start to, like, become a factor? Well, we, we got a lot to improve on, so it's, I think it's important to come back and look at the tape, uh, build on some of the things we're doing well, but, but correct on things that, that we need to correct on. And, um, you know, we got a long way to go still. Coach, you're, you're a person who will hold your team accountable how does the balance work because I know after the game there were a lot of things you that were in the moment you said we should have done X Y and Z right sure at what point do you say okay I got to let them enjoy it but we got to get back to work I think there's a balance there um, I have a lot of good coaches on my staff I just say Brian Cox reminds me a lot of times to enjoy it uh, but I think that you just straight with the players um, you congratulate them on a good win, but there's a certain standard that we want to play to, and I think you need to let them know as a, as a head football coach of here's the standard and this is what we want. Now, uh, we put a lot of hard work, a lot of preparation. The guys do a great job all week. Uh, they laid it on the line for 60 minutes, and, and we earned that win, but, but there's always things as a coach that you're thinking, oh, what can we do better and, and how can we get our team to play better? Yeah, you're always thinking about the next matchup, right, and the next game, and. Now you guys got to get on another plane and you know it's a long ways away. You guys are playing to Seattle. What are some of the things that you want to do this week with your team to try to prepare them for that contest? Yeah, so you know we have you know our training staff, our, our medical staff, our nutrition staff, our strength staff, our sports science staff. You know we, we all collectively talk about how we want to approach not just this game but really the last few games where we had to travel to Europe, then we come back, we play a home game against a tough Baltimore team, then we fly down to a weather game in, in Jacksonville, now we got to fly to, to Seattle. So it's kind of a comprehensive four-week plan. And then this week, it's, it's its own unique plan. And I have those people in those areas talk to the team about what we can do right now, starting on Monday all the way through to get prepared to, to play our best on Sunday. Coach, I think one of the more impressive things that I took away from the game is the offensive line and the offense in general were not deterred by a team that came into the game that was ranked pretty high against the run. It seems like you, the determination of, hey, we got a pretty good back and pretty good scheme that we, we feel good about. Was that something that you were proud of, just that the fact that from the first half to the second half, that they just stayed at it until the running game got going? Yeah, absolutely. And in and, and these games, it's tough. You know, they're they're trying to stop 26, uh, so there's always a, a cat and mouse game here of, well, they think we're going to run them, so let's do something else. But I think that you have to put it in the hands of the players. And even though it gets muddy in the first half, uh, gains of one and gains of two, you stick with the running game, uh, particularly our running game, to try to get stronger in the third and the fourth quarter. And sometimes those one and twos go for five or six or even more than that. Um, and, you know, we want to be a tough physical team. Coach, we, uh, we appreciate the insight. We're not done with you yet. We're, you're going to get to go in the film room with Carl and do a little building blocks. So we're going to get to break down a little more film. Uh, stay right there. You're watching the Coach Dable Show, presented by Stop and Shop, the official supermarket of the New York Giants.
Welcome back to the Coach Dable Show. Coach, tough, gritty game, but there were some key plays to either start the game, end the game, or to prevent the other team. So all three phases contributed in this. Let's take a look at the offense here in the first quarter. Sure, yeah, this was obviously a point of emphasis, getting off to a faster start, and this was the first drive. You know, we had driven down to about the 32-yard line, and it's, it's second and 14. We have a negative play on, on first down. I think Coach Kafka does a really good job of dialing up a kind of a shot play for us here in this situation where we're already in field goal range, and, and he wanted to be aggressive on this. So they're playing, you know, man-to-man -man outside with these corners against Slayton and Johnson. And, you know, both of them do a really good job on their release. They're kind of getting soft press and then hold in that line so that Daniel's got, you know, five yards there to work with. But both of them do a good job on their respective sides. Daniel comes out on the drop. He sees the post safety. He holds him for a second. And then his arc and pace is really good. He gets it up and down before the safety can get over there, read his eyes. And the corner has a chance to go ahead and, and make up speed and make this play. But a well-executed play, a good timely call by Coach Kafka, and got us on the board here early. Now, Coach, there are a few elements of this. You talked about the releases, right? So releases against press man coverage, especially in long yardage situations, you really want to get your receivers out and going to get a step. But you also mentioned something else, the quarterback holding the safety. So yep. when you've got two go routes, you don't want that safety to have a quick decision to make. Is that correct? Exactly right. We don't want to get our eyes right to him right now so he gets over there and has a chance to to make the play based off of his, you know, speed to go ahead and, and break this thing up. Uh, but again, well executed, good protection. You know, we had a chip with Bellinger there. Saquon steps up in the hole. It's a seven-man protection scheme. Daniel takes his drop, takes one hitch, gets it up and down, and uh, it was good to get off to a fast start this game. Well, now that's one play that kind of got this game started for you. Now the one that ended the game, the longest one minute, and <laughs> <laughs> it, it took forever to get here, but then yeah. here's the last play. You know, you make this play, the game is over with, and so many things went right here, but the, at the end of it, let's just take a look at it, and we can talk about it. Yeah, seven seconds left, so really it's got to be, you know, in the end zone, unless they want to throw some type of quick throw and get a little bit closer. And they line up in, a, in an empty set, just like they had done previously the first couple plays. And they're really running all verticals with two in-cut breaking routes here, really in front of the goal line. And we have you know, one, two, three, four, five guys in man coverage with three guys deep, uh, really squatting at the goal line with vision on the quarterback. And I would say, you know, just a, just a heck of a job here by Moreau and then Julian on the break. You, you can see he sees Trevor throw it. He plant points and he goes. And that contact right here, we're, you know, inches away from this going the other way. Great resolve. You know, Julian tries to get the ball up, but it's just an excellent play by Fabian of wrapping him up and then driving him to the ground. And then here comes X in, LC. And just what a, what a great play at the end of the game. You see the leg drive and all those hours in the weight room that they work on their strength and their lower body. And, you know, this, this isn't the easiest thing either. You know, these guys are pushing and, and pushing them back. And now you see these big offensive linemen come in and, you know, try to push the pile back in the other way. Um, you know, great resolve by our guys. Now, when you look at just the job that Moreau did to start this stop, if he tries to throw a shoulder in here, he probably scores. That's exactly right. But just to wrap him up and then get his body going away from the goal lines, going, you know, east and west. Now, once he wraps him up, it gives the other defenders a chance to get in and help. No question. I think the other thing that helps is, you know, his feet are planted in the ground, so he can use his lower body power and explosion mm -hmm. to, to move Kirk back. You know, Kirk is up in the air, so right now he doesn't have any power other than the momentum of him jumping. So. You know, our ability to stay on the ground and, and play with good position and then wrap up and use our leg drive uh, really was the difference in the game. And, you know, he still fights through it, but what a, what a great play here by X2 of coming back in because you don't know what's going to happen after sure. that. So just a good finish. 
uh, you know, the true meaning of, of playing 60 minutes, and that's what it took. It took all 60. And the ball comes out. And the ball comes out. All right, now you got offensive play, you got defensive play, and you kicking got game special here. teams. Yeah. So another uh, Nick Nick McLeod's been doing a really good job for us in this part of the, of the game, uh, whether it's been a gunner, vice, here off the edge, as a primary blocker for us on, on the extra point. Uh, just does a great job of one getting off on the ball and then getting thin you know the wing doesn't get much of them getting thin and then jumping right where he needs to jump to the back tip of the ball extending with two hands and I think it helps too with the push we get inside from you know Dexter from Jelly from Hottie from Coughlin uh, it was a well executed play and anytime you can prevent points or get points in the kicking game that goes a long way I spent 12 years on this team, right? Okay. And there's a tendency to, to take a playoff. No doubt about you it. You know, because you can go hard every game and the coaches are saying, hey, just keep pushing, you're going to get this, right? Because once the other team sees you on film doing this, they've got to be more responsible themselves. So, you know, I would always encourage teammates, we just got to keep going. We can find a weak link somewhere in here. And sure enough, the effort week after week, now it produces results when you need it the most. No, no question. This is, this is a big play in the game. I mean, a blocked kick, whether it's a punt, a field goal, an extra point, um, those are big, big momentum changers in games. And you can see all of our guys, you know, from across the board, you know, we're selling out on these things. And, you know, we have awareness if people want to go ahead and try to fake it and do things like that. But I'd say the push that we get from, from Dexter and Jelly and Hottie and Coughlin, really do a good job of shortening the corner and then Nick takes advantage of it and makes a timely play. It's good to get one of those. Well, it's good to get one of those, Coach, and you got a hard-fought victory and on to the next one. I'm sure you got, you got a lot of things to correct, but yep. it's always easier to do it after a win. No question about it. Thanks, Thanks, Carl. Coach. We're all smarter, and we'll be back with more of the Coach Dable Show. Welcome back to the Coach Dable Show, presented by Stop and Shop. Time now for Head to Head with Paul Dottino and Victor Cruz. All right, so now it's time to go head to head for the key matchups between the Giants and the Seattle Seahawks. Now, first up, we've got to go with Julian Love against Will Disley. Now, before we talk about this battle, let's hear what Love had to say with a little live mic action last week against Jacksonville. Good juice, good energy. Hey, you have him! No. Right here, Dion's go. Hand off ATN. Dashes up the middle. Inside the 10. Fumble the football. Loose in the end zone. Recovered by the Giants. Come on, ATN. And the Giants get a big turnover as Julian Love recovered it on the short hop. Hey, hey, hey. that's a lead. Uh, come on. Come on. Still up and he didn't make it. Giants stopped him on fourth and one. This is where you go close the door. Yeah, I got you, baby. Caught at the one yard line. Giants stand him up. He's not in. Very and the game's going to run out. The Giants stopped him at the one yard line. Giants win. Six and one. Lots to improve on, but we're six and one. Let's go. Well, obviously, Julian and the Giants had themselves a good time in Florida. Now, in talking about this matchup, Victor, mm -hmm. Love goes against Disley. Well, also go against Noah Fant. But, see, they play a lot of two tight ends. And Disley, well, he's already got three touchdown catches on 19 grabs on 20 targets. Love says you got to keep aware of him. I think he's a threat. Um, they do a good job of using their tight ends in their game. Uh, and so that's what it is. We've got to be accounting for him. Uh, in all phases of the game because he's a threat. Now, you talk about their tight ends. They'll use two and three even uh, on occasion. So how wary do you have to be of their bunches and, of course, how they block in the running game? Yeah, I think they have, you know, they have a really good unit and a really good scheme for what they do uh, in terms of tight end position. That you see them sometimes with two, three in the game, uh, like you said. And they're talented. You know, they got fan over there. And they, got, they got some studs. And so we got to be accountable. We got to play big. Um, and we got to be able to stop the pass when they're in the game as well. Now, as we count the days down, Metcalf is banged up. Now, whether or not he plays, I would have to think that even if he does, they're going to probably look at the other targets. And that would make Disley a more valuable threat for them, right? 
Yeah, you know, we're preparing like uh, 14's going to play because um, he's he, he's a serious player. I know he's tough, so I'm sure he's going to try to get back for this game. That's our mindset. But, you know, if he doesn't, then he, he doesn't. And we'll, we'll adjust our plan accordingly. Now, it'll be an interesting matchup. I'm really excited to see how Julian Love fares with both of these tight ends. But Will Disley specifically, he averages 11 yards per catch, which is pretty high for a tight end. So you want to make sure that he's physical with him, that he's disrupting him off the line of scrimmage, because you just don't want him to have any free goals off the line and keep his targets very, very low. Now, it's interesting to me, Victor, because Wick Martindale loves to use three safeties. Mm -hmm. He loves to blitz guys all over the place. But Love has only blitzed one time over the last four games. They like him more in center field. Why do you think? Well, I just think he's a smart player. I think he understands what he sees. He understands different different route combinations and different types of players. So understanding that, you want to keep him kind of in center field, kind of like your center fielder back there, surveying the entire field and making instinctive plays left and right, which he does very, very well. Well, we'll certainly have to keep an eye on Disley once again. He has a 39-yard long touchdown grab against Denver. That came back in week one, so he can get downfield. All right, let's look at the next matchup, Victor. And it is John Feliciano against Jordan Brooks, Seattle's very strong linebacker. This guy has 73 tackles, is second in the NFL, and has at least eight stops in every game this year, which means John and company have to keep an eye on him. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, very quick, sideline to sideline. Their D-line does a good job of uh, keeping the double teams off him and letting him do the great things that he's the, good, the great things he can do. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a challenge with him this week. Yeah, it looks like with some of the other bigger names who aren't there anymore, he has really established himself as the heart and soul and the leader of that defense. Mm -hmm. Can you tell that from looking at the tape? Yeah, I mean, it, he's, he's filling big shoes, um, and I think he's doing a great job. Now, what about his blitz capabilities? I noticed he's got some quarterback hits and some pressures, so obviously they're including him in their package. Yeah, um, he's slippery. Uh, he's very quick and uh, can drop the shoulder and bend the edge. Um, mm. He'll be a good guy to play against. This is going to be a big matchup for John, specifically because Jordan Brooks is a really good player. Obviously, we talked about his accolades at length, but he's just a strong, physical, downhill player that John Feliciano is going to have to know where he is. That entire offensive line is going to have to know where he is at all times. So Jordan Brooks is going to be a handful, but the offensive line, along with John Feliciano, has to make sure they keep a key on where he is at all times. I think it's really important to note that the Giants are second in the NFL with 73 rushes up the middle, right behind Feliciano back. He's been durable, he's smart, and they average 4.7 yards a carry in doing so. Now, Victor, we all know that once Barkley gets some room, he can be dangerous. So it's very key for Feliciano to make sure he gets the right reads and the right calls at the line. Absolutely. It's all about preparation, mental preparation first, and then you execute. But if they're able to get a body on him and able to get some position and start to move him wherever they want and attack that aggression, kind of negate that aggression, it'll leave some running holes for Saquon and the rest of that running back group. Yeah, getting to Brooks at the second level is really going to be a key. In fact, last year, Brooks tied an all-time Seattle record held by Bobby Wagner with 20 tackles in a game. He can really ruin things. Baller. Well, that'll do it for this edition of Head to Head. Carl, so we just heard him talking about John Feliciano versus Jordan Brooks, obviously center, former center, former linebacker. I know one of the, my biggest challenges was always getting to the mic, getting to the second level. When you watch film, on offensive linemen. How much did you look at their technique and their formations and what was it that you were studying? Well, it was always formation, but you had to start with the center, especially because he's going to take you to a lot of the plays just based on his first steps. And with Feliciano and getting to the mic, it is very important because this run game has been impressive. And it's one of those deals. If you're a defender, you got to play it for four quarters of it, because if you stop it some with Saquon Barkley, as they've shown with this offensive line, they are persistent and they'll get him going at some point. Yeah, it's all about angles. And of course, when you're on the road too, sometimes the crowd noise can be a factor. So, you know, you might be in the silent count as well. I know that's always a challenge, but uh, you know, you linebackers, you're always a little bit faster than us. So I- it's, Well, that's why you got to read the angles because yeah. you guys know where you're going before we do. So. Yeah, absolutely. We've got to beat you to the spot. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, we're not going to get there. All right, great stuff, Carl. Next up on the Coach Dable Show, we've got Over Under with Madeline Burke, Victor Cruz, and Amani Toomer. You're watching the Coach Dable Show presented by Stop and Shop. Welcome back to the Coach Dable Show presented by Stop and Shop. Time now for Over Under with Madeline Burke, Amani Toomer, and Victor Cruz. 
It's game time. A little week eight over under our favorite game of the week, other than the football game, of course. Giant Seahawks. Let's get right into it. Victor, I'm going to start with you. Yeah. Over under 175 rushing yards by the Giants in Seattle. Man, I'm going over. I, I think we're going to have a really good rushing day. I think with the balance of Saquon and the things that Daniel Jones likes to do with the football in the running game, it's really going to balance. It's really hard for teams to kind of key in on both of those things. So I'm going over. Not by much, but over. <laughs> well, since both of them had 100 last week, Saquon and Daniel Jones, I'm going to go under. Ooh. Because if you're a defense coordinator with your worth your weight and salt, you're going to want to – stop what they did last week and not let them repeat it. So I'm going to go under just because of the fact that they did it last week. I'm going to agree with Vic and take the over here, mostly because we have seen the Saints, the 49ers, and the Falcons all eclipse that 175 on the ground against this Seahawks defense. All three of those teams average far less than that on the season. So I'm going to take the over there. All right, Amani, over under three plays of 35 or more yards allowed by this Giants defense? Allowed? Uh, I think I'm going to go over because this is a bend but don't break defense. So the big plays don't really concern them as much. They just are really good in the red zone and really good holding teams to field goals opposed to touchdowns. This isn't one of the focuses of this defense. Yeah, I'm going over as well. The, again, bend but don't break. I think this defense understands their roles and understands how they need to play different offenses. And once they get inside that 35, 20-yard line, they're a tough team to score against. So I'm going over. I'm going to take the under here because 35-yard plays, that's a big play. Those are chunk plays. I feel like we might see some big ones, but I'm going to take the under on that one. All right, Vic, over under 300 yards passing and rushing combined for Daniel Jones. Oh, know, man. See, I'm, I'm riding the hot hand. I'm going over. I'm saying he's on the heater right now. He understands exactly. I mean, it's been the past couple weeks he's gotten better and better at commanding the offense, understanding what he needs to do, understanding what's being asked of him week in and week out. And we saw that like prime time coming to fruition this past week. So I'm going over. I think they put a great game plan together to attack this defense. And I think he's going to eclipse the mark. I'm going over as well. I just think Daniel is coming on to his own. And I just, I'm not a big believer in this Seattle Seahawks defense because, you know, they've been giving up a lot of plays, giving up a lot of yards. And uh, I think he's going to do more through the air. I don't think he's going to get 100 rushing yards like he did last week. But definitely, I'm going to go over 300 yards combined. I'm taking the over as well and agreeing with Amani's point on doing more through the air. I mean, last week we saw him hit eight different receivers in the passing game. He's spreading the ball around. One of these guys is bound to break it off for a big gain as well. So let's take the over on that one. All right, last one, Amani. Over under two and a half sacks by the Giants defense. Ah, I'm going over. I really like sexy Dexy. You know, <laughs> this, this, this defensive line is really starting to put pressure on quarterbacks. Hey, when, when last week... When when Dexter Lawrence got the, uh, the 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 personal foul, I was a little excited because we don't usually because the Giants don't usually have that much pressure on the quarterback to be getting <laughs> personal fouls like that. But that defensive line is really coming into their own and really understanding again their roles. I think football is so important about understanding your roles and executing that role at the highest level. And this defensive line, this defense as a whole, is really starting to understand that and they're getting after the quarterback. I'm going to take the over as well because I think Wink might mess around and maybe blitz a little bit. Uh, I don't know if, that, if that's going to happen. Um, uh, but Gino's also been sacked 16 times this season through seven weeks, and that average mixed with this defense, let's take the over as well. 100%. All right, that's a wrap for week eight over under. Sean, back to you. Thanks, Madeline. All right, Carl, two things are portable whenever you're traveling, right? A good defense and a good run game. If the Giants get 175 yards rushing on the ground, I feel like that's a, a pretty good formula for a win. It is, and the fact that they can do it multiple ways. It doesn't all have to come from Saquon Barkley, which gives the opposing defense 11 men they have to defend because with Daniel Jones, he can run. They have scripted runs and he can improvise. But when it comes to silence in the crowd, nothing does it better than a run game because the communication is pretty condensed and everybody knows what they have to do. Yeah, if you can run the ball well on first and second down, it makes sure. third and two a lot easier when you're not dealing with, uh, with all the, the loud noises. Um, certainly, Wandell Robinson getting involved in the run game, like you mentioned. It's not just Saquon. Daniel Jones coming off of a 100-yard rushing uh, performance last week against Jacksonville. So, no doubt that will be a big factor. Still to come on the show, we've got strategy with this guy, Carl Banks. You're watching The Coach Dable Show, presented by Stop and Shop. Welcome back to the Coach Dable Show. Time now for strategy. And Carl, Geno Smith is playing some of his best football. He right really now. is. And what they're doing here, uh, Sean, I'm going to take you through. Now, they show a lot of confidence in, obviously, their best receiver, DK Metcalf. 
But Geno Smith's confidence in his arm talent is just something we hadn't seen in a very long time, probably since coming out of college. This is basically a one read throw. You've got a safety over the top. So whatever happens here, this safety is supposed to be shading to DK Metcalf. But you can see he stays locked in here. He's one guy down the field here. He's not looking anywhere else. Steps into the pocket, lets it go, drops it right in the bucket. That's in between three defenders there. So Geno Smith, whatever the narrative was, he has dispelled that with his ability to really read a defense and then just let the ball go. Yeah, he's been really accurate, too, and, and two touchdowns last week. He's also taking care of the football. Carl, he's already thrown 11 touchdowns this season. His career high was 13, so yeah. you're really seeing growth with him in this offense. Yeah, and we're going to take a look here again at a, at a different angle here, Sean. He's just going to step, climb the pocket. You can see he's just reading it all the way and then just lets it go. Here's the other part about Geno Smith in this next play. We're going to see – a quarterback-friendly offense. And when I say quarterback-friendly, they're making all of his reads relatively simple here. When I freeze this, I'm going to bring it back just a little bit. I'll freeze it. Now, he's got everything he's throwing to in one window on this side of the hash. So all of his options are one, two, three, four options right in one central area. But it breaks down, and this is the talent of Geno Smith again, that play breaks down, he gets on the run, finds an open receiver on the other side. So it's not like you can say, well, they're making the offense easy for him. They are, and that's what offenses should do. But if, he, if those options aren't available, he's resourceful, he gets open, he's got, he can take off and run here, or he can just throw it, in which he does touchdown. Geno Smith, you know, I don't think people think of him as a running quarterback, but he's showing the athleticism right there and being able to extend the play. And he's, he's extremely mobile. Now, on their backfield, on the offensive side of the football, Kenneth Walker is something special. Like, he's a rookie, but he is great vision, great jump cutter. And let's just take a look, because I, I really want to go over this with you, being someone who's blocked for running backs, jump cut in the hole there, jumps back mm -hmm. outside, cuts again, gets a first down, and then some. But wow. let's just break down the anatomy of this play because as a defender, number one, this guy goes into a hole and teases you right here. He freezes your defense in this window right here, right? But if you're the guy who's supposed to set the edge, there's a thing called setting the edge, and then there's a thing called a soft edge, right? To be there, here, you, you would think, oh, yep, he's got the edge set, right? Because the running back sees his own color, right? Yeah. But I call that a soft edge because when you know a back can bounce, you've got to be up here when you set the edge and then force the runner back inside. But you can see good blocking, and as soon as the, as soon as the defender peeks back inside, he jumps back outside. I mean, he's quick as a hiccup, too. Yeah, he's got springs for legs. You can see this penetration right here by this backside defensive tackle is kind of what spooks him out of that hole. Yeah. But not a lot of running backs have that jump cut ability where they can basically be in the, in the hole almost and jump out of it and still have the acceleration to get around the perimeter. Right, but this vision, his vision is right here. And then when he makes the decision to go back outside – He's trusting that this guy is going to somehow peek inside. But, like, as a defender, you would think, ah, good job. You got him pushed back. But yeah. when you set the edge against certain backs, a tie goes to the runner. You've got to literally show on the other side. He's got to see the defender in order to deter him. He doesn't. And away he goes. And then open field, it's hard to tackle him. He makes guys miss in open field. And you can see right there, one, two, three, four missed tackles. And he's got the speed. He's got the, the, the quickness with the jump cut. But he's also got the power to break those arm tackles and to get the yards after contact. So as an offensive lineman, you know you just got to hold your block a little bit, and he does the rest of the work for you. Absolutely. Yeah, for the defense, they've got their challenge ahead of them. That was Strategy with Carl Banks, presented by PSENG. Committed to providing safe and reliable energy now and in the future. Still to come on the show, we've got Above the Numbers with Paul Dottino and Imani Toomer right here on the Coach Dable Show, presented by Stop and Shop.
Welcome back to the Coach Dable Show presented by Stop and Shop. It's time now to go above the numbers with Paul Dottino and Amani Toomer. Okay, so let's go above the numbers for the Giants and the Seattle Seahawks upcoming this weekend. Now, Amani, first up, I've got to go with Richie James. And it's not just going to be about his receiving numbers, although for sure his numbers have gone down since Wondell Robinson has come back into the lineup. But I want to talk about his punt return game. You'll recall in week one, he had five punt returns for 62 yards. Since then, only six returns for a combined 16 total yards. That is not helping field position for this offense when they take over the ball. Seattle's only allowing 7.2 yards per punt return, 11th best in the NFL. Don't let them tilt the field. Richie's got to set this offense up better. Absolutely. I, I was a punt returner, loved playing punt returner, but it was a very tough position. But sticking in that with the same theme you have in the receiving core, I'm going to pick Darius Slayton. Darius Slayton is a guy who has a lot of talent. It's been ups and downs, but these last three weeks, he's been a very big contributor, either with big catches for first downs or he had uh, pass interference calls in the end zone that led to the go-ahead touchdown versus the Ravens last week. This is a guy who has everything you would expect in a receiver. He has the speed. His contribution could be the difference between the Giants just having two major weapons on offense to three in the wide receiving core with a dynamic possible number one receiver if he can get his entire game together both mentally and physically in uh, for this offense I like that call Amani because in each of the last four games Slayton has played at least 50 percent of the offensive snaps so he's getting burned again and he's producing he's had 11 catches over that time 10 of them have gone for first downs yeah. that's a 91 percent clip and he's averaging 15 yards a grab. Keeping so I really moving. like Slayton Absolutely. and what he's doing lately. Yep. All right, let's go below the numbers. And we've got to go with Tyler Lockett, the Seahawks' outstanding receiver. This guy, in each of the last three seasons, has had at least 70 catches, at least 1,000 yards, and at least eight touchdowns. He is dangerous. Absolutely. And with DK Metcalf going out, he's going to be the major target for Geno Smith. Yeah, in fact, he's had two 100-yard games so far this season, had a two-touchdown game against New Orleans. There's only two scores of the year, and he's got 114 straight catches, Amani, over the last two seasons without a drop. Mm. Talk about consistency. That's tough to do. It is. Well, that'll do it for this week's Above the Numbers. Let's go back to Sean. Thanks, Paul. So, Carl, no DK Metcalf for Seattle right now, but Tyler Lockett, he's a handful. Tyler Lockett is as good as they come. Like, if there was no DK Metcalf, we'd still be talking about one of the more dangerous receivers in the NFL. And let's not forget, also, Kenneth Walker can catch out of the backfield, too. So I suspect they're going to they're gonna mix it in a lot of, of Lockett as well as Walker because they'll keep the chains moving. Yeah, Tyler Lockett always seems to – he's not just a deep threat guy. I mean, he always seems to be attacking the middle of the field, and he and Geno seem to have a, a pretty good – uh, chemistry going right now, but yeah, you mentioned Kenneth Walker. He's running with a lot of power, so uh, that's another weapon for Geno offensively. Yes. No doubt they want to get pressure on him. Coming up, Coach rejoins us right here on the Coach Dable Show, presented by Stop and Shop. You know, on offense, we've had so many contributions to, throughout this year from so many different guys in different ways. Jones takes the snap back. Steps up, fires it over the middle, completes it for a first down across midfield as he's able to hook up with David Sills, first down Giants. At the end of the day, it's one week, and, and uh, it's about what you do consistently over the course of the season. Smith looking for Goodwood, and a jump ball caught by Goodwood for the touchdown. It's going to, you know, it's going to be a challenge, and I think we're ready. Um, you know, we're going to continue preparing throughout the week, and Sunday show up. Hand off ATN. Dashes up the middle. Inside the 10. Fumble the football. Loose in the end zone. Recovered by the Giants. We just don't quit. If we keep going and keep scratching and fighting, that we're going to come on top. Welcome back to the Coach Dable Show, presented by Stop and Shop. Coach, uh, obviously, Geno Smith is a guy that's been around the league uh, a long time. He's kind of having a resurgence here with, with this with this stint with, with Seattle, obviously winning the quarterback job over Drew Locke early on in the training camp. Uh, what, are you, what are you seeing from him? Yeah, he's playing at a really high level, making really good decisions, accurate with the football, doing a good job inside and outside the pocket. 
uh, has really done a good job of, of helping that offense, you know, and lead them to scoring points. And now this week against Seattle, Kenneth Walker, right? He's a powerful young running back. Uh, what impresses you about the way he plays? Yeah, he's got good speed. He's got good quickness. Uh, he makes positive yards every time he touches the ball. Go back to Michigan State. He was a dynamic football player for them. Uh, re really carried that team a long way last year. And, you know, his, his first few games that he's playing, he looks every bit the part. Um, just a tremendous player with good vision, good power, good quickness, breaks tackles, makes people miss. Um, He's a good football player. Coach, with the uncertainty of one wide receiver, Lockett is still, by any measure, a really good wide receiver in the NFL. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things he does, considering he plays both inside and outside? Yeah, very flexible uh, in what he can do. He's got really good short space quickness. He's a savvy route runner. He's got good hands. He can hurt you deep. He can hurt you intermediate. And he can hurt you short with some catch and run plays. Uh, you know, he's done it for a long time in this league. I think he's a very, very good player. Uh, again, he can line up in multiple spots, and uh, we're going to have to do a good job with him. Coach, obviously, uh, I've played in Seattle before. The, the, the noise is a factor. Uh, what, I, you guys have worked silent count before. You guys have worked some of the crowd noise. How, how do you incorporate that into practice to get them ready for Yeah, that's, we're going to have to start from day one with that. Um, it's a great fan base up there. It, it is loud. I've played up there a few times. and. Uh, we're going to have to do a really good job of communicating uh, and sometimes just, you know, visual communication rather than verbal communication, and, and that starts in practice. When you're teaching that, does that start on the outside in, or is it the inside out with your linemen, then to your wide receivers when you talk about the nonverbal stuff? Yeah, usually from inside out. Uh, I think that's the way football needs to be played, too, not just uh, communicating, but, you know, start from the inside and, and work out um, again whether it's a hand signal, a nod, but we're going to have to do a great job of getting in and out of the huddle uh, to make sure we hear the call. We have to do a good job relaying the call. This will be, you know, pre-snap, the communication part of that, whether it's on defense or offense, we're going to have to do a good job of that as coaching staff. Coach, thanks so much for your time. Always great to talk a little ball with you. And this game is presented by AWS, a proud partner of the New York Giants. And don't forget, immediately following the game, you could join us on the post-game live show on MSG Networks and on Giants' YouTube channels. For Carl Banks and our entire crew right here, and thank you for joining us on the Coach Table Show presented by Stop a Child.